We want to make better returns with lower risk. That's kind of the holy grail. I really think we do our best work as a team and when, when we have multiple portfolio managers working together, you need to have the confidence to, to bet against the herd um, and the bravery to put it on in, in good size. What's it like to manage the money of the man who broke the Bank of England? I literally just got off the phone with him and I really kind of cherish those calls and, and value his input. Um, and working here is, is really a privilege. Dawn Fitzpatrick is the Chief Executive and Chief Investment Officer for Soros Fund Management, the $28 billion family office of billionaire investor and philanthropist George Soros. I love what I do. Every morning I kind of pop out of bed to to come and do this. A distance runner at the University of Pennsylvania, Fitzpatrick was built for the high stakes competition on Wall Street. I was a distance runner, so kind of Forrest Gump. I wasn't fast, but I could, I, I could run a really long way. Fitzpatrick spent 25 years at UBS, where she most recently served as the head of investments for its $645 billion asset management business. In 2017, she joined Soros. I'm a really competitive person. I love that I get a score scorecard every day. Fitzpatrick has overseen an annualized return of 19.2%, and those returns have helped fuel billions of dollars in grant making. This year, the foundation will give away about $1.8 billion. So we like to make enough money to fund um, th their good work. What is it like to be the chief investment officer and chief executive officer for Soros Fund Management? He's one of the most legendary investors of the 20th century, and I guess maybe the 21st century. Um, does he call you every day and say, do this, do that, or you basically have the ability to make the decisions you want? Well, I literally just got off the phone with him. So um, while George now spends the majority of his time on the foundations, especially with everything that's going on geopolitically, um, he, you know, he still watches markets and there are things that catch his attention um, and, and he'll call and, and, and share views with me. And, and I really kind of cherish those calls and, and value his input. Um, and working here is, is really a privilege. It's, um, we run just shy of $30 billion effectively for a single client, which is the foundations that George start, started, the Open Society Foundations which are the largest private funder of human rights um, causes around the globe. So especially in times like now when, with Ukraine, um, they do a, a tremendous amount of really important work. Um, so it's, it, it, it's a privilege to work here. You've previously worked for publicly traded companies. Yep. So is it easier to work for a private company, a private family, because you don't have to worry about the stock market every hour on the hour? Absolutely. Um, I, so I spent 25 years at UBS b before joining Soros Fund Management, um, and they were a great 25 years, but there are, there are definitive constraints when you're working for a publicly traded company, especially a really highly regulated bank. Um, and when I was there, I, I ran the investment um, side of the asset management business. We had thousands and thousands of clients and, and hundreds of different products that I oversaw. So in that capacity, there are real constraints in terms of what the, any given investment mandate is um, versus here, we really have um, a very, very wide remit. So how does the process work now at Soros Fund Management? Uh, you're the CEO and the CIO, so do you tell your team, this is what we're going to do, and they say, yes, we're going to do it, or they come to you with ideas and you say, maybe yes, maybe no. How does it work? Yeah, so we have a top-down asset allocation. So a general idea on where we want to be overall on our overall global equity exposure, our fixed income exposure. But then we have uh, over 100 internal investment team members and they all have investment mandates and they'll come to me. So they have degrees of freedom within that mandate, but very often there'll be an idea they like for their mandate, but instead of buying 100 million, they want to buy 500 million. And that's when we have the conversation about whether it should be upsized. And one of the things at SFM we can do is because we can invest across any asset class in almost any geography, um, we, can, we can really connect dots and operate in the spaces in between where the, the typical asset management industry can go. So George Soros is very famous for, among other things, saying if you get a really good idea 
uh, pursue it to the extreme. In other words, put a lot of money into something. Famously, he did that when he helped break the uh, British pound in like 1992, I think it was. So does he uh, influence you in that way? If you have a really good idea or somebody has a good idea, you say we're going to put a lot of money in or you try to be uh, risk adverse and not put too much in any one thing? When I came here five years ago, um, George had not been involved day to day for a while. And interesting, the portfolio I inherited was over diversified. And when you have an over diversified portfolio, you're like guaranteed mediocrity. So over the past five years, we've really tried to streamline the portfolio. Um, and, and definitively, one of the things we spend a lot of time on is making sure our best art ideas are right sized. One of the interesting things, though, in the investment world is a lot of times, and I'm sure you see this, the best ideas, there's a limit to how much you can actually buy, right? They're not, the capacity of them is not, is not infinite. So usually that's the constraining factor is, is the sheer amount available. So for the large amount you're managing, let's say it's 30 billion or something like that, um, do you have to uh, try to get a certain rate of return every year? Do you have a benchmark say we want to earn 9%, 10%, 11% a year, or whatever it might be higher than that perhaps. What is your benchmark you're trying to earn? So the foundation, um, this year the foundation will give away about $1.8 billion. So we like to make enough money to fund um, th their good work. Um, but I would say when it comes to, to like targeting a return, it can be a little bit dangerous because your opportunity set is not always equal. And if you target a fixed return, you'll take too little risk when the opportunity set is the best and too much when it's the worst. So we kind of think of a return over a cycle. And when it comes to measuring how we're doing, we look at other endowments and foundations. We compare ourselves versus, versus you know, a simple 60-40 or 70-30 type portfolio. Um, but we want to make better returns with lower risk. That's kind so, of the holy grail. Where do you get your ideas? Do you read the newspapers? You read journals? Friends call you up? Other people in the same business call you? George Soros calls you? Who calls you up or where do you get your ideas? It's all of the above. So, so I read a lot. You know, in the morning I, I'll skim through two or three different papers. Um, during my days I'm meeting with a lot of smart investors and, and smart people running companies. Um, you learn a lot from there. I talk to peers, but I think part of the trick of this big business is being able to really aggregate and assimilate information. Um, and w one of the other tricks of this industry is, is trying to find sources of in information that are different than the other people in the business because you don't want to get crowd think. And I think that happens a lot in this business. Everyone's talking to the same people and a view becomes consensus that might not be really grounded as well as it should be in facts. The DEI issue in this industry is really important to me and I do feel an obligation to help get that fixed. Women like Soros Fund Management CIO Dawn Fitzpatrick are the exception in finance, not the rule. Morningstar has taken an in-depth look at women in the industry, and the numbers are startling. The firm found that in 2020, women made up 14% of global fund managers. That's largely unchanged from the year 2000. Morningstar also calculated that while the number of women at the top of the corporate ladder has increased, it won't be until 2060 that women will reach parity with men in the C-suite. Studies have shown that increasing the number of women managers leads to better decision making and moderates overconfidence. European Central Bank President Christine Lagarde insists that male domination of the banking industry made the 2008 collapse of Lehman Brothers more likely. As Lagarde put it, if it had been Lehman sisters rather than Lehman Brothers, the world might well look a lot different today. You are the first woman to be the head of Soros Fund Management. Is it a challenge today as much as it was when you first joined the investment world to be a woman or it makes no difference anymore? So in my career, I've, I've really never thought it's either a, a, an advantage or a disadvantage. I think there have been points in time when it's been one or the other, but in aggregate, um, I think it's been fine. But I'd say the investment industry overall 
has really not done a good job having women in, in senior roles, especially on first order in investment roles. Okay, so I guess there's a long way to go. Yeah, so, so it's interesting. Obviously this is something you know, I'm pretty passionate about changing. When you look at entry level jobs in the industry, women come in at over 50%. But what, and I know there's a lot of focus both on that hiring and then at kind of board level. Um, but I actually think the problem is in the middle. So it's helping women get over kind of that first, second, and third level of promotions. And I can give you a little, a little story about, about myself where my career could have gotten derailed early on. So I began my career at O'Connor and uh, Swiss Bank had bought us and over time, Swiss Bank made a bun bunch of other acquisitions. I was a proprietary trader, but they wanted to build an investment bank sell side capacity. So they took a bunch of us the proprietary traders and, and said, all right, you're gonna build a client facing investment bank sell side business. And I was on the convertible desk and it was myself and a bunch of men. When you build a sell side desk, you need traders and you need salespeople as the only female trader, they asked me to be the salesperson and to be candid in convertibles. Um, you know, there weren't a, weren't a ton of great personalities. So, so the bar might not have been that high. But the bottom line is, I might have said yes to that, but I've had someone in my career who along the way, even to this day, every decision I make, I just sanity check with him. And he basically said to me, he's like, you are a natural investor and you're not that charming. Don't become a salesperson. And without that advice, I wouldn't. You'd be I'd, a salesperson. I'd be a salesperson. Okay. I hope I'd be a good one. And do you think increasingly you're going to see more women in the industry, or you think it's really there's a bar, and really you're not going to get women in a higher percentage than they are today? If I have my way, we're going to see a lot more women in this industry. And again, I think it's an industry that women can excel in. Now. In recruiting people here, presumably a lot of people want to work here. George Soros is very famous. You're very well known as well. Um, how do you pick people to come here? They have to have a track record, go to a good school, um, be ambitious. What is it that you look for? So first of all, I want a team that looks very different, so that brings that broad perspective. Um, we obviously want people who are first order good investors. But the other thing is I want individuals who are gonna come here and make the other people around them smarter and believe that they will be smarter for sitting next to um, the other people on this team. I really think we do our best work as a team and when, when we have multiple portfolio managers working together. And again, I think it's something that the traditional asset management industry has a hard time solving for to the degree we can. So uh, when you're hiring, are you trying to deal with diversity issues as well, DEI, I mean, other things like that? Yeah, so um, my head of trading is a woman, and she's awesome. Um, and in our intern program, we are purposely leaning in to women, um, black and Latinx. Um, and one of the things is we're not just hiring them to come in and give them internship. We're basically committing to, to fostering their careers for the next decade, because again, that's what's not happening. The internships are 50-50 across the industry. We're losing those candidates along the way. And we, we uh, you know, as, as, as senior people in this industry have to commit to not doing that. All right, so George Soros is pretty famous for being, I'd say on the left side of the political spectrum, as people would probably say. Yep. And uh, therefore, presumably cares a lot about things like ESG. But if a deal comes along, it's a great opportunity to uh, drill in oil somewhere. <laughs> Uh, would you not do it even though you can make a lot of money or because the ESG might not be so wonderful or is that a factor when you're making decisions? No, we, we care about that, you know, and the foundation for whom we manage money and George care about that. So we actually just put our climate strategy out um, on our website for the public to see. And we think it's really important that we do that. Our strategy isn't, we're not just, we're not drawing um, kind of necessarily hard lines. What we really want to promote is the actual transition. So we're trying to be very pragmatic, but also continue to hold people to a, to a really high bar. The other thing I'd say about the asset management industry, it's hard for them on climate. Um, you know, you have a lot of different factions who have different vested interests. We get to solve for a single client, so we feel like we can speak out on issues 
that are important for the industry as a whole in ways that maybe others can't. You don't need to have a good idea every day. So there's times to be patient and there's time to press. So to be an investor, what are the qualities that one takes? Is it high IQ, willingness to work hard? What is it that takes, what does it take to be a great investor in your view? Yeah, so I, I think you have to be intellectually curious. I think you have to know what you're good at and understand your limitations. Um, I think you have to be able to have the confidence to know when you're right, because you make money as an investor when the market has one thing priced in and, and you believe that it to be incorrect and you bet on it, it proves to be correct or it becomes the market's view. Um, so I think you, you need to have the confidence to, to bet against the herd um, and the bravery to put it on in, in good size. Um, and, and the humility to know when you're wrong, you know, you, you cut your losses and move on to the next trade. Now, I guess that's why I wasn't a good trader, because when I uh, go the wrong way on something, I just say, you know, I, I'm going to stick with it forever. I don't like to admit a loss. But when you're a trader, you're supposed to say, okay, I made a mistake. I'm going to the next thing and get rid of the position. Yeah, and I think, by the way, there's two reasons you want to do that. First of all, because, because you, you know, usually you just compound cost, costs when you leave a bad trade on, but also the distraction factor of, of having a bad trade. Um, it takes up too much mind space. Now, do you have children? I have three great teenagers. And do they want to be investors, or you're trying to talk them into not being investors? They absolutely want to be investors, and I love that they do. Um, one of the silver linings of COVID is that these teenagers became enamored with markets and cryptocurrencies in a way that I think is durable. These kids are watching markets in a way that I don't think generations have for a while, and um, I think it's great. So teenagers are not famous for going to their parents for advice. <laughs> so, but do they go to you for investment advice or just parental advice? They, they. Uh, I'd like to think they come to me for both, but 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 they do call me. You know, when Elon Musk made his bid for Twitter. Um, my, my son and, and three of his friends had me on the phone a asking what was going on. A lot of younger people do seem interested in crypto and there are a lot of people who are older who say this is going to go away, but now it's unclear whether crypto is really going to take off or the government's going to do something. What is your own view on crypto? It's here to stay. I think it's gone mainstream. Fidelity just announced you can put it in your 401k. Um, the one caveat I would say is, first of all, Climate impact is going to become increasingly in focus. So in that context, I think Ethereum is likely to gain some more traction over Bitcoin. The other thing I would say is that um, when we look at companies in the kind of blockchain crypto space, you know, it might be a security audit company. They all have, have massive treasury accounts with a lot of coins in them. Um, and to me, that creates a little bit of near-term vulnerability. Um, but that said, I think, I think blockchain technology is going to have some great applications and um, crypto is here to stay. What about SPACs? Uh, less of a fan of SPACs. Um, I just think they're, they're really misaligned with the end buyer. And I think Chairman Gensler um, kind of and, uh, taking a hard look at them and, and kind of pushing through right. reforms, I think is important. It's overdue. It's the right thing to do. And how do you look at other new areas? Are there other new areas like crypto that you try to figure out to get on the ground floor? Are there any that you can mention now that you're trying to get on the ground floor of? Anything new? Yeah, so I think um, kind of democratization of access to alternatives um, in a way not, not like SPACs, where, where they're, 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 you layer in um, kind of uh, asymmetric fees is interesting. So fractional ownership. And again, that's things where like blockchain technology can actually accelerate. So if you think about things um, like insurance and, and um, the, the kind of being able to distribute that ri risk among thousands or hundreds of thousands of people in an industry that otherwise has, has had a lot of friction, I think that's really, really exciting. It's been reported that the U.S. economy actually shrank in the first quarter of uh, 2022. Uh, do you think this means we're likely to go into a recession? 
there's a lot of discussion about a looming recession. And the bottom line is a recession is inevitable. It's a matter of when. Um, and when you look at what markets are pricing here, they're pricing it fairly soon. So in the 2023 con context, depending on which asset classes you're looking at, I actually think markets might be wrong. And the reason is, is the consumer right here is in extraordinarily good shape. We've just gone through a US earnings season. The credit card companies, delinquencies are way below pre-pandemic levels. People are paying down their credit cards um, at at levels that were way, way faster than pre-pandemic. So it's a long-winded way of saying the consumer is in reasonably good, good shape. There's no doubt real wages are negative. In other words, your, your or real wage growth is negative. So wage increases are not keeping up with inflation. But I do think consumers, to me, feel like they're being measured and they're, they're in good shape. Now, you and I have served as advisors to a New York Federal Reserve uh, kind of committee. Do you think the Federal Reserve missed the boat on inflation and maybe they should have moved more quickly earlier on, or do you think that they did the best they could? In hindsight, they should have moved earlier. Um, and I think they're doing their best to, to catch up now, and I think you're going to see them move really aggressively. So market already at uh, 50 basis points at the next three meetings is already priced in. So I think you're going to see them rush to get rates up to the two, two and a half percent range. And then I think they're going to reassess where the economy is. Um, it's a hard, they had a hard job. So what is the best investment advice anybody's ever given you? I'd say the best investment advice anyone's ever given me is you don't need to have a good idea every day. So there's times to be patient and there's time to press. Okay. What do you think is the most common mistake that investors make, the average investor, the most common mistake? I think it's FOMO. So buy high, sell low. Um, you know, and, and the amount of damage that does the average investor um, is, is big. Let's suppose I'm an average person, middle income, not a professional investor, and I have some money. Um, let's suppose I have an extra $100,000. Uh, what would you say that person should do with 100000 to put in an index fund or something else like that? Yeah, I mean, I think for the average investor, buying an index but buying and holding and just letting it compound is really sen sen sensible advice. Um, I think the more trading someone tries to do, the more damage they tend to do. And today, um, if you hadn't gone to Wharton, do you think you'd been in this business? I think going to Wharton um, was a game changer for me in terms of what it exposed me to and, and it definitively led me to this career. Um, and the education you get there as an undergrad is incredible. Um, the things I came out of that school knowing relative to um, my peers at, you know, right out of college, um, I felt really well prepared. And have your parents been able to see your success? They, they have. Um, I'm actually I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of building a house where we'll be living right next to each other. And they say, well, we're responsible for all this great success, or how do they remind you that they raised you in a way that made you possible for have this success? I, I actually remind them that they're, 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 they're responsible for all the success. We didn't have a lot of money growing up, but I never wanted for anything, and it was they, they always pushed us um, to kind of seize opportunities and, and be the best we could be. And I really owe them a lot.